dear listeners, and welcome to another edition of the Dream Nation podcast. I'm your host, Yulia. And before we go into the show, I want to tell you about Dream Nation Creative. It's a full-service creative agency that my partner Ina and I recently launched. At the agency, we work with brands to help tell stories around woman empowerment, diversity, and social impact. You can check us out at dreamnation.io. You can also say hello at hello at dreamnation.io. We'd love to work with you in 2018 and help you achieve your goals. Give us a shout. And uh, speaking of advertising, today on the show, I have Keith Stroop, who's an attorney and founder of NORMAL. NORMAL stands for National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. So I decided to interview Keith Stroop because I've worked in advertising in New York for the last 10 years, and I've also worked a lot in pharma. I worked on a lot of really great brands that helped a lot of people. Going forward in life for the next 10 years, I was wondering what I would like to do and where I would like to put my attention. And I've decided that I really believe in medical cannabis. I'm really interested in health and wellness. And after living in L.A. for the last three, four years on and off and really seeing the movement that's happening on the West Coast, especially in Denver and uh, Washington and L.A. and how progressive the West Coast truly is, I've decided to spread the gospel. So I really wanted to answer a lot of questions that people have in regards to cannabis. There are a lot of, I guess, stereotypes. There are a lot of questions that people have. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I decided to speak with Keith and um, answer a lot of those questions that people who are not familiar with the cannabis prohibition might have. So I hope you find it helpful and uh, enjoy the podcast. All right, so we are here with Keith Stroop from Normal, and I'm so excited to have him on the show because he's a personal hero of mine. He's been doing advocacy for medical cannabis and cannabis for the last 40 years. I have so many things to talk about, and I'm going to try to keep it to half an hour because I'm (laughs) cognizant of your time. So my first question to my guests is, what was your dream as a kid? I I wanted to be a lawyer when I was in high school. First, you know, I, I don't remember before that, but the time... I was in high school and thinking about college, uh, my father's best friend was a lawyer. And I'm not sure I knew that much about what lawyers did, but I was impressed and he was friends with our congressman and things like that. So uh, I sort of came into my uh, manhood thinking that what I wanted to do was to grow up to be a lawyer. And strangely enough, I did that. Now, I'm not practicing the type of law I presumed I would be. I thought I'd be, you know, representing private clients and getting rich and having a boring life. Uh, What happened was, uh, because of some work I had done with consumer advocate Ralph Nader in the uh, uh, late 60s, I was just out of law school. I was trying to stay out of the Vietnam War. I was a draft leader, and uh, the National Lawyers Guild helped me get what was called a critical skills deferment, uh, which was a provision of the draft code that said that if the work you're doing domestically is so important, then you can serve the time you would be in the military doing that. Well, I had just been hired out of Georgetown Law School uh, for a presidential commission called the National Commission on Product Safety. And again, I was uh, delighted that working for this presidential commission allowed me to avoid the draft and stay out of Vietnam. But what was more important as it worked out was uh, we worked around Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader had come to town and he'd written a book called Unsafe at Any Speed. And he, he had sort of defined public interest law, that is using your law degree or your legal skills to impact public policy rather than to help individual clients. I was exhilarated to learn about that option. So when the commission ended, I was at that point too old to be drafted and I was free to do what I wanted. What I wanted was to do public interest law, but I wasn't so concerned about product safety. I had first smoked marijuana when I was a freshman at Georgetown Law School. So by that point, I wanted to legalize marijuana. And that's exactly why we founded Normal in late 1970. And uh, I know that you founded Normal with the help of um, Hugh Hefner, which I'm going to get to in a second. But I also was going to tell you that I love Ralph Nader. Ralph is a huge influence on my life. It was at UMass that 
I really heard him speak. So it's interesting. Oh, yeah. that Ralph had an enormous impact over two or three generations, I think. And if you remember, when he first started his work, he had young law graduates called Nader's Raiders who used to come <laughs> to D.C. and spend a couple of years. Well, because I was working at the president at the National Commission on Product Safety, uh, we spent a lot of time at Ralph's office reading his mail to see which products were dangerous and were causing people problems. So I became friends with all of the Nader's Raiders during those early years. And interesting, Ralph himself, of course, is, is a, quite a traditional straight fellow. I doubt that Ralph ever saw a marijuana <laughs> cigarette, let alone smoked one. But all of the early Nader's Raiders were more like myself. They had all been introduced to marijuana somewhere along the line. So uh, for that for that two-year period, uh, we spent a lot of time on the weekends at my house uh, getting loaded. <laughs> well, we're all beatniks, you know, it's about diversity and it's about having an alternative frame of mind and being able to question society, which brings me perfectly back to Hugh Hefner, who is a very controversial figure. And I actually love Playboy. It's one of my favorite magazines. So you got a little bit of seed funding from Hugh Hefner, who was a cannabis advocate. And uh, Playboy played a crucial role in helping to convince um, that marijuana prohibition was a really destructive policy. How did the two yeah, of you it, meet? Well, again, it actually circled back to the Nader's Raiders, coincidentally. Uh, one of the early Nader's Raiders, John Esposito was his name. He subsequently became a fairly prominent public interest lawyer based in New York. But uh, during those early years, and I was literally right after we'd found it normal, and I was looking around for funding, and I was running it out of the basement in my house, John Esposito said to me one day, have you tried the Playboy Foundation? And frankly, I didn't know they had a foundation. I, of course, as a young American male, I was aware of the magazine. I think like most adolescents, I probably was hiding it under my mattress when I was 15 years old or something. So I, in any event, I went through the process of applying uh, to the Playboy Foundation, to their credit, they sent a couple of people out to meet with me from Chicago. They came out to D.C. to make an initial appraisal of whether this was something they were interested in. And then they invited me back to a meeting of the Playboy Foundation Board of Directors in Chicago at the Playboy Mansion that was a, where Heft lived at the time. And, um, you know, we, we had our first meeting. And, of course, Heft was three or four hours late for the meeting because he's always on his own schedule or he was on. And uh, but. We, we hit it off. I mean, Hef is a guy who, I don't think most people knew this, but he quit drinking alcohol when he was fairly young. And so he was living that high style of fast lane living, but he was a marijuana smoker. He drank Pepsis. Whenever you see pictures, he always had a Pepsi Cola. And uh, so as a result of his personal uh, uh, sort of appreciation for marijuana and the fact that he really was a, a social activist, he had a section in that magazine called The Forum where uh, if we would go out during those early years, now, first off, he, he started off by giving us $5,000, I should add, which wasn't very much, and it kind of scared me because I thought, my goodness, what am I going to do after the first couple of months? But they said, look, demonstrate that you can use the money effectively and accomplish a couple of things, and then we'll probably be good for some more. Well, within a year, they had committed to giving Normal $100,000 a year in cash, as well as two full-page ads in the magazine in each, uh, a year, and each of those would bring us maybe twenty, twenty-five thousand 25000 in cash. And then he had this section in the magazine called The Forum where uh, any time we would identify some young person who had been locked up for a long time in prison, and we'd go interview him and we'd file a, a motion to try to get him out of jail. Whenever we would focus on any of the victims, Playboy would focus on them as well. And so all of a sudden, we had millions of people aware of some of the damages being caused by marijuana prohibition, and many of those people didn't realize it. You know, they thought it was no big deal. They didn't smoke marijuana themselves, so it didn't seem like a relevant issue for them. So Hef really helped us mainstream the issue of legalizing marijuana. That's fascinating. I know that, you know, cannabis in the 60s was a way to also crack down on anti-war movements and African-Americans and also sexual freedom and civil rights. And um, in the last 60 years, you know, what have you seen the evolution of cannabis policy? 
evolve into. In the African American culture, we still have four men for every one That's white right. man going to in prison. Fact, in some states, the arrest discrepancy is as high as eight to one. Wow. Uh, but African Americans are arrested anywhere from four to eight times as frequently as white Americans, even though we smoke marijuana at the same rate. It's so between 14 and 15 percent. Um, ACLU did us a great favor over the last several years that they began to analyze marijuana arrests first in major cities and then statewide. And what we discovered was it wasn't just in one or two cities or one or two states. It actually is nationwide. In New York City, for example, uh, they went from under Giuliani. When he was mayor, they went from something like 5,000 marijuana arrests a year, up to 55,000. And the vast majority were young black men who they would hold up on the street and pat them down and ask them to empty their pockets. Well, even though marijuana technically had been decriminalized up to an ounce, meaning it was a $100 civil fine, it was still a crime if it was in public view. Well, the police would make them empty their pockets and then claim the marijuana was in public view and arrest them and throw them in jail. So, I mean, even as late as, you know, five and 10 years ago, the marijuana laws were still being used uh, as a power lever against minority communities. And I suspect that will always be a challenge to try to get the criminal justice system applied in a fair manner. Which, you know, kind of brings me to my next question, which is how can we break down stereotypes of lazy pot smokers? Many pot smokers I know are very, very, very successful. I actually think that pot smokers are a lot more productive. It gives them the ability to focus, and especially in high-stress environments. You've identified uh, the problem. Historically, marijuana smokers were perceived as lazy and losers and down and out, and if you smoke a marijuana cigarette, you're going to be a heroin addict. And of course, the government advanced those uh, absurd allegations for 20, 30, 40 years under the reefer madness period. So it's not totally surprising that a lot of older Americans have an exaggerated view of marijuana and its potential danger. The only way to overcome that, or at least the quickest way to overcome that for certain, is for more mainstream, middle-class, hardworking marijuana smokers to come out of the closet. And because, again, we need to overcome the negative stereotype. Now, the problem with that is that for the majority of marijuana smokers, if they were to stand up and come out of the closet, and write an op-ed piece or do an interview in the local media, they would lose their jobs because most private employers still retain a what they like to call a drug-free environment. It's not drug-free because you can go out at lunch and have two or three beers with your colleagues and go back to work, or you can take prescription drugs. But at any event, they still consider most private employees still require a drug-free workplace. And if you test positive for THC, uh, they will fire you without any showing that you were impaired on the job. So we recognize that a majority of the responsible adults who use marijuana don't have the luxury of coming out of the closet, but that makes it even more important for those of us who do have that option to exercise it. I'm thinking, for example, a travel writer, Rick Steves, a wonderful man who's on our board of directors and a dear friend of mine. Uh, Rick is wonderfully successful. He's made millions of dollars. He's one of the most the true celebrity. Every time Rick speaks, he makes sure the people know that in addition to his travel work, He's a, a recreational marijuana smoker, and he thinks there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And you can imagine how someone with his uh, kind of Boy Scout aura, wholesome guy who is totally non-threatening to anyone, yet he's a responsible marijuana smoker. So uh, for those of us who happen to be either self-employed or employed with a nonprofit or employed with some some place where we're not going to lose our ability to support our families, come out of the closet. Do it in a responsible manner manner so that those people who see you, what they think is, well, my goodness, that's just like my neighbor. Well, we are your neighbor. <laughs> you know, there are roughly one out of two Americans have smoked marijuana at some time in their lives, and uh, roughly, I think, 34, 35 million uh, just in the last year. So uh, uh, marijuana smokers come in all shapes and sizes and colors and political persuasions. We can't be stereotyped any longer, but the obligation is on us to come out of the closet so that people know that. They have nothing to fear for responsible marijuana smokers. We need to do a huge awareness campaign almost, like, you know, the Me Too movement, and maybe we yep. need something for cannabis. If we could somehow figure out how to 
cause something to go viral along those lines. There's no doubt how the, the Me Too movement, they have caused a major shift in, in our culture and how we look at sexual harassment. Uh, if we could do the same thing for marijuana smokers, it would be, I think it would speed along the process of legalization enormously. One of the issues that we're working on now is we need social lounges where we can go meet with other marijuana smokers and socialize like alcohol drinkers do at bars. Right now, none of the states have yet done that. Now, they're in Colorado, the city of Denver has legalized it, but they haven't granted any licenses yet. And in Massachusetts and I think one other state, uh, they are openly discussing now whether to allow marijuana lounges to open. Well, of course we need marijuana lounges to open. If there's nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana, there's no basis to suggest we can only smoke sitting in our homes. That's fairly limiting. Can you imagine if you could only drink alcohol in your home? Frankly, I think it might be a better place to live if you could only drink alcohol in your home. But there's no way you put that genie back in the bottle either. So there are lots of areas where we still have work to do. For example, irresponsible marijuana smokers, as I mentioned earlier, can still lose their job because they test positive for THC without any indication that they were impaired on the job. Just because they smoked last weekend, they get drug tested on Wednesday, they get fired. DUIDs in a handful of states, if you have any THC in your system and the cop pulls you over, thinks you're acting erratically, tests you for alcohol and you don't test positive, then test you for THC if you have any THC in your system. You are convicted per se of driving under the influence of drugs without the slightest evidence that you were impaired while you were driving. Similarly with child custody issues, we have people calling almost every week at normal who are having to fight the child welfare agency to maintain custody of their minor children because some nosy neighbor smelled marijuana and reported them to the state agency and they start off with a bias that says if you smoke marijuana you're probably not a fit parent. Now that's just bullshit and we need to get over those. But the first step, we have to legalize marijuana, then we have to go back and fix some of the fine tune it, basically. I think you would actually probably be a better parent when you're a little high because you'd be a lot more patient and a lot more oh, loving. Without doubt, by the way. I mean, uh, my I smoked marijuana when my daughter was growing up. She's now 47, 48 years old, I guess. But uh, when she was young, both her mother and I smoked marijuana. And uh, I think we were generally, when we were smoking, we, we slowed down. We spent more time with her. We played with her, you know. So when we were, were not smoking, we were busy. We were trying to get the, the important things done that day. So, uh, no, I agree. I, I think most parents who smoke marijuana moderately are better parents, not worse parents. You know, I love the idea of lounges, too. I love the idea of coming together. And I think, you know, maybe pot can also be a way to cure racism and bring people together, too. Because if they came out into public areas where they could meet other people and realize that everybody is the same, there's something about sharing a bowl with somebody or you know just being in the same room where you can just have human connections again well by the way i sometimes uh, when i'm giving a lecture someplace confide to the audience that uh, i know that most people think this is uh, going too far but not only do i think there's nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana i think my life is enhanced by my marijuana smoking in the ways that you were suggesting. I think that when I'm smoking marijuana, for some reason I'm able to stand back a half a step and look at my life or look at the challenge I was facing that day and see it in a, a more understandable manner. Uh, see people who I thought were threatening me and maybe now I realize, no, they weren't threatening me. We have some things in common. I think that uh, the responsible use of marijuana makes you uh, a more enlightened individual and a person who deals better with the problems that we all face in life. Now, again, I understand I'm not going to go to a state legislature and stand up and argue that they should all get high because it'll improve the quality of their lives. But I certainly do say that it has improved the quality of my life. And I think there are tens of millions of marijuana smokers out there that feel the same way. I think so, too. I think we're so busy in this day and age just rushing. And I think it's almost like a pause button that makes you just really take a 30,000 square foot view, question things, and like really try to make the best decisions. 
Oh, I can go on about it forever. My other question is medical cannabis is now legal in 28 states. What have been the effects of legalization on local communities? For example, Colorado is thriving. What are the overall findings on society that you can share? Well, um, interestingly, when we had marijuana legalization on the ballot in California in 2012, now this is the one that we lost. We got about 57%, I think. But nonetheless, we lost that issue. And we had the benefit, we turned around and won it, obviously, in 2016 in California. But we had the benefit of a funder who provided the money for us to do exit polling to find out for those people who opposed the initiative, what worried them? What was it about it that caused them to oppose it? And we discovered there were generally two areas that non-smokers are worried about. Number one, they're worried there might be a big uptick in adolescent marijuana smoking. Now, the reality is what adolescents have been telling us for years uh, is that it's easier to get marijuana when marijuana is prohibited than it is to get alcohol because with alcohol, you have to get a fake ID or find an older friend to buy it for you. You can sometimes pull that off, but not always. Uh, The age limitation, it works pretty well most of the time for underage alcohol drinkers. But if you're buying your marijuana on the black market, nobody asks your age, they don't care. They're just trying to sell the drug. So uh, by legalizing it, it's harder for adolescents to get it. And indeed, having five years now of experience in Colorado and Washington and about two or three years now in Oregon and Alaska, they're finding the same thing. They've had no increase. And in fact, there's been a slight decrease in the rate of adolescent marijuana smoking in Colorado, for example, since they've legalized it. So I think we now have enough uh, honest track record. We can answer that concern. And by the way, I want to make this point too. People have a right to ask those questions. We need to slow down long enough when we're making our arguments for legalization to make sure that if reasonable people have questions, let's provide the answers. The second area that they had a concern about, I understand this as well, is driving under the influence. There was this impression that if you suddenly legalize marijuana, you'd have millions of stone drivers on the road. Well, first, I guess the first question I would like to ask is, did they think that we've been smoking marijuana for all these years and not driving? You know, I mean, we've we've been smoking and driving all along. I'm not suggesting one should do that without being careful, because what the research actually shows is that for about 60 to 90 minutes after you smoke marijuana, you are somewhat impaired. Not terribly. It's not anywhere near as, as debilitating as it is when you're drunk. But that's not the standard. The standard is we want people to be safe when they're driving. So at Norma, we make a special point of uh, making sure that smokers understand don't drive when you're impaired. So give it an hour to an hour and a half after you smoke. But the other thing the research shows is this, that the type of mistakes you make when you drive impaired with marijuana have to do with driving too slowly. You're not sure if you pass the exit you're looking for, if it's the next one coming up. You know, it's mistakes that have to do with short-term memory loss primarily, but the marijuana smoker knows they're impaired compared to the alcohol drinker where the types of mistakes an alcohol drinker makes are aggressive mistakes. They speed, they pass on the curves. And so you have you know millions of people over a period of time being killed in car accidents where with marijuana smokers, as I say, the kinds of mistakes they make are generally not fatal mistakes. So we don't want anyone driving impaired under any drug, but I can assure you that if everyone who's currently driving after they've been impaired with alcohol, if they would switch to marijuana, we would be a lot safer in this country. And again, what they've demonstrated in the states that have done it, there's not been a big increase in DUIDs. Now, there is a there is a reality that once the police know you've legalized marijuana, they're sort of looking for it more than they used to be. So, you know, there are going to be a certain number of people that are going to be busted where they're going to be in violation of the state law on marijuana. But the answer to that is we need a test for impairment, not simply do you have THC in your system. If you're a regular smoker, you'll have THC in your system for several days and even several weeks after you last smoked. But again, you're only impaired for about an hour to 90 minutes. So the test that we need, we need every cop on the beat to have, and they have iPads and things anyway now, to have a test they can administer on the roadside that determines whether or not you are impaired. If you're impaired, you should get a ticket and be taken off the road. But if you're not, 
the fact that you smoked marijuana over the weekend should not cause you to be charged with a DUID. I agree. Alcohol is such an accepted part of society. You know, marijuana is going through the same prohibition that alcohol went through. And um, and I think there's so many yeah, overlaps. It's, it's amazing we didn't learn from alcohol prohibition. You remember, I mean, alcohol prohibition ended in 1933 and uh, marijuana prohibition didn't begin until 1937. You would have thought that the country would have realized if prohibition didn't work for alcohol, it's not going to work for marijuana. But it took us a lot longer to get around to reaching that conclusion. But again, uh, the point is, we are at that point now where 64% of the country say they support full legalization. And it's not because they're pro-marijuana. It's because they're anti-prohibition. So we're winning this battle. We've got some more work to do, and we'll be at it for a few more years. But I don't think there's any doubt about the outcome. You know, there's also talk about labs popping up all over town needing to test the cannabis that is coming out. And also, if you can control the cannabis, you can control the gang violence and the mob control of the drug trafficking as well. Because if it's legal, then it's going to be a lot easier to control that side of it. Well, also, when, when it's legally regulated, uh, before you can sell a marijuana, it has to be tested in a state-certified lab. You have to make sure there's no moles or dangerous pesticides. You want to make sure it's labeled accurately for THC and CBD. And I imagine in the near future, we're going to want to have terpenoids, the primary terpenoids listed as well. So there is definitely, we're moving in the right direction for public health uh, by providing that information. When you're dealing with a, a black market, uh, there is no way to assure the product is safe and effective. It's, uh, it's simply uh, buy, it, buy what's available and give it a try and see. Now, you know, we, most of us, I've been smoking for, I think, 53 years, and so I somehow managed to survive on the black market during all that time. But I'm sure there were times when I, what I was smoking, I would not have wanted to smoke if I had known what was in it. And I agree. And you know what makes me really nervous is seeing the sale of Monsanto to Bayer, and it makes me terrified of what kind of products they're they're going to be putting in CVSs. So, well, they're going to try. They're going to try to sell us a pharmaceutical version of marijuana. They already are. There's a drug called Sativex that's sold by GW Pharmaceuticals out of England. It's been legalized in several European countries. It's not yet in the United States. But uh, again, what what patients tell us when they use that is it's not nearly as effective as whole smoked marijuana. What they've done is they've taken one active ingredient out of marijuana and uh, synthesized. Synthesized it. It's not even it's not even real THC. They've synthesized THC, and somehow they thought that that would do the same thing as whole smoked marijuana. Where whole smoked marijuana has uh, over a hundred active ingredients, and one of the most effective, of course, for medical users is cannabidiol. Now they're trying to, in some states, say, well, we'll let you have cannabidiol, but you can't have any THC in it. The research indicates that the cannabidiol works for medical purposes most effectively when there's a similar amount of THC with it. So the idea that we need to eliminate THC for medical patients is a mistake. We're heading in the wrong direction. But again, I, I don't I, I don't want the pharmaceutical companies to have any basis to come in and take over the medical marijuana field. I want, I want the patients to continue to have the option, at least, of smoking whole smoked marijuana. Going back to the social impact, I'm really interested and using the funds, the tax money from legal medical cannabis going back into the communities, you know, pumping it back into the school systems. Our schools need so much help. And Colorado has been a market where they've been using the cannabis funds for education, which I think is really wonderful and improving the communities. And there's a way to, you know, I think I was reading a Washington Post article. I know people are going to roll their eyes. They said that um, if cannabis is legalized, it can create 1 million jobs and add 162 Two billion dollars into the economy. And I know that Cory Booker, who I love, and I've been trying to get him on my podcast for the last year, he just introduced the Marijuana Justice Act that is um, also supported by Barbara Lee and Representative Ro Khanna, and they're both amazing. And, um, you know, what is the impact of society on this bill? Can we actually get all of this through? Well, I, I think eventually you're right. Initially, if you're in a state where marijuana has always been considered something dangerous, etc., then it's hard to make an effective argument argument that they should tax and regulate it because you could use the money. It's sort of like if people consider it sinful 
for example, to gamble. Then they don't want to legalize gambling. But over a period of a few years, they get more accustomed to it. They see neighboring states legalize gambling. So now we've got a situation where I think in every state in the country, there is some form of legal gambling. In Missouri, for example, you can't, still can't legally gamble on land, but they have these boats that never leave the dock on the Mississippi River where you can go out and gamble. Well, I think we're getting to that stage now with marijuana where the majority of the people now recognize there's nothing inherently evil about smoking marijuana, and it's far less dangerous than the other alternatives. So why not use that money? As you mentioned, in Colorado, the first, I believe it's 40 or 44 million in tax money that they raised. And by the way, they raised, I believe it was 275 million in tax money in 2017. Their market overall was a billion dollar market, retail market in marijuana. So the first 40 million go to schools or school construction. And But there are some other good public interest that some of that money is allocated for. I think that's a great idea. I'd like to see states get even more creative with how they use that tax money. In California, it is estimated that the total retail market this first year will be six billion dollars and that the state will raise one billion in taxes just overnight with California flipping over on January 1st to legalization. The total legal market in this country went from roughly six billion to 12 billion overnight. And you can just imagine, as you say, what it would be like if we did it nationwide. And we will eventually. I hope so. So that brings me to my next question, which is the final question. What is your dream as an adult? You know, I enjoy smoking marijuana when I, I don't smoke during the day because I'm busy, I work, etc. cetera. I, I, I wouldn't want to have the short-term memory loss that comes with it. But when I get home in the evening, if I'm not traveling, the first thing I do is I roll a joint and pour a glass of wine and watch the news. Uh, you know, I live in DC, so I'm always following current events. I consider marijuana legalization to be only incidentally about marijuana. It's really about personal freedom. And so my goal in all of this is to get the government out of that aspect of our personal life. Almost no one that I've ever met thinks the government should be able to come into our house to know what books we read, what music we listen to, how we conduct ourselves in the bedroom, and neither should they uh, have access to know whether we prefer alcohol or marijuana when we relax in the evening. It simply is none of their business. I love that. And I think with technology, it makes it so much easier to have their nose in all of our information with social media, with technology. And um, I, But I think we have to use these tools to raise our voices like what we're doing right now and uh, and fight for our freedom. Yeah, if we don't do it, it won't happen. In other words, no, there's no one out there who's going to do it for us. Those of us who smoke marijuana and who pose prohibition have to get involved. And they are more and more every year. Our support numbers continue to go up. And again, it's not just the smokers, it's their families, their friends, the folks who may not smoke marijuana, but understand that prohibition is a failed public policy. So uh, I suspect, you know, as I say, we're at 64% support now nationwide. You can imagine that means on the East and West Coast, we're probably up near 70% because we always have a little lower support in the Midwest and the South. But I think you're going to see those numbers continue up probably up to 80% or higher over the next three or four years. We're winning. Again, I don't want people to get lazy or to sit on their hands. We still have a lot of work to do. But almost every week, there's another new development that moves us closer to legalization. I love it. Keith, thank you so much for being on my show. It's such an honor. It was so great speaking with you. And let's keep in touch. You're quite welcome. Well, thank you for including us. Thanks for tuning into the show. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Dream Nation Love. It's not Dream Nation Podcast. It's Dream Nation Love because I think my single mission in life is to teach people how to love a little bit more. And together we can save the world. So it's Dream Nation Love, share it with your friends, have a great day, and go out and make the world a better place.